What happened to the Titanic submarine? Ocean Gate Disaster Recently, everyone has been talking about the Titan submersible operated by Ocean Gate, which went missing in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. The submersible was on a tourist expedition to view the wreckage of the RMS Titanic, with five individuals on board, including the founder and CEO of Ocean Gate, Stockton Rush. The massive rescue effort by the U.S. and Canadian Coast Guard proved unsuccessful early on on June 22nd when evidence of the wreckage of the vessel started emerging, leading to the tragic conclusion that the vessel imploded in the ocean depths, killing everyone on board. So what happened aboard the submersible? And what can we learn from this? Ocean Gate Incorporated is a privately held U.S. company operating out of Everett, Washington that provides crude submersibles for the tourism industry and research and exploration. The company was founded in 2009 by Stockton Rush and Guillermo Sol. Interestingly, Rush, who was among the victims, was married to Wendy Rush, a descendant of Isidore and Ida Strauss, two people who passed away in the sinking of the Titanic. The tragic events happened during a deep sea tourism expedition to explore the wreckage of the Titanic which sank in the North Atlantic in 1912. Before we get to the specifics of this particular tragedy, let's put into context just how difficult deep sea exploration is. It's easy to be in awe of aviation and space exploration because breaking free of gravity and flying through the air seem like such feats. But in many ways, deep sea craft pose a much greater engineering challenge. It all comes down to pressure. We don't think about air pressure because at sea level, it's just 14.7 pounds per square inch. That pressure is the result of the column of air that reaches above us into outer space. All those very tiny molecules above us pushing down result in that pressure. However, water is a much denser fluid than air. So for every 10 meters or 32.8 feet that you dive, the pressure increases by one atmosphere, or 14.7 psi. The Titanic sits on the ocean floor at about 12,500 feet below sea level. The two broken parts of the ship, the bow and the stern, are more than 2,600 feet apart and surrounded by debris. Let's put this depth into perspective. Imagine lying on your back with a one foot by one foot board at 100 meters, the size of a soccer or football field, we have the pressure of 10 atmospheres or 145 PSI, which means on that one foot by one foot board, we would feel the weight of 20,880 pounds. That's equivalent to 4.7 Tesla Model Ys. At 3,800 meters, close to where the Titanic wreckage is, the pressure is 376 atmospheres, and that one foot by one foot board on our chest would weigh 797,000 pounds. The Ocean Gate Titan was rated for a maximum dive depth of about 4,000 meters. Comparing that to the difference in pressure in an airplane at cruising altitude of 36,000 feet, where the pressure might be three PSI on the outside and between 10 and 12 PSI on the inside. Hopefully, this puts into perspective why more people have been to space than have been to the deepest parts of our oceans. Now, let's talk about the red flags that plagued Ocean Gate from the get-go. First, the design limitations of the Titan required that the hatch be bolted down by 17 to 18 bolts from the outside. This means there is no way for the passengers inside to open the hatch. They would have to rely on ground crews to open it. This is understandable because these deep sea vessels have to be incredibly tight and strong. The water seals have to hold. However, this also shows why it's really important to have backup systems, such as an explosive detonation cord that you can pull to blow the hatch if the craft services and no one finds it. That was one of the early fears that the vessel could surface and be somewhere along the Atlantic, unfound, and the passengers would still die from suffocating because they couldn't open the hatch on time before the air could run out. The Titan also didn't have GPS or other navigational instruments on board, and it didn't have a locator beacon either, like a black box on an aircraft. 
Most subs use GPS for near surface navigation, which doesn't work in deeper waters. In deeper waters, they use dead reckoning, course information obtained by the ship's gyro compass. By the ship's gyro compass, measured speed and estimates of local ocean currents. They also utilize inertial navigation systems, which provide an estimated position source utilizing acceleration, deceleration, pitch, and roll from the computers that transmit this data. The Titan, in contrast, appeared to rely on data provided by the surface support vessel. The Titan, in contrast, appeared to rely only on data provided by the surface support vessel. Journalist David Pogue, who rode on the Titan to view the Titanic in 2022, noted during his expedition that the surface support vessel lost track of the Titan for about four to five hours. He mentioned that adding a locator beacon was discussed during this event. They could still send short texts to the sub, but they had no idea where it was. It was quiet and very tense, he said. The craft was also controlled by a video game controller, which is downright stupid and dangerous. But let's talk about how OceanGate got to the Titanic. OceanGate started by purchasing Antipodes, which is a submersible, back in 2012. This was their first test bed for testing and learning about this entire endeavor. Next, they built Cyclops 1 in collaboration with the University of Washington's Applied Physics Laboratory. This was a deeper sea vessel capable of reaching a maximum depth of 500 meters, still nowhere near deep enough. In the early design, the hole was made of carbon fiber and the submersible would dive vertically with pivoting seats to ensure the passengers remained upright. It was said that Boeing worked with OceanGate and the University of Washington on their initial design analysis. Finally, they arrived at the Titan, their final product that would be rated for 4,000 meters. One of the key takeaways about the Titan is that it has a carbon fiber and titanium hole, which is exotic in the world of materials. We have been using high strength steel and aluminum for a long time, and we have engineering data on how they fail and what to look for in test methodologies. But carbon fiber is still quite new. OceanGate also signed a contract with Spencer Composites in January 2017 for the carbon composite cylinder. After the disappearance of the Titan, the University of Washington stated that APL, Applied Physics Laboratory, had no involvement in the design, engineering, or testing of the Titan submersible. A Boeing spokesperson also said that Boeing was not a partner on the Titan and did not design or build it. A NASA spokesperson said that NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center had a space act agreement with OceanGate, but did not conduct testing and manufacturing via its workforce or facilities. All of these partnerships that they had are now being revealed that they were not, in fact, partnerships. This is a classic example of a company trying to gain credit by partnering with NASA, which sounds good, but the extent of their collaboration isn't well understood. David Lockridge, the Ocean Gate Director of Marine Operations, also filed a quality control report in January 2018, stating stating that no non-destructive testing NDT, or investigation NDI, of the carbon fiber hole had taken place to check for voids or delaminations in the carbon fiber layup that could compromise the hole's strength. NDT or NDI is a way of checking something to ensure its safety without breaking it apart. Lockridge expressed concerns about relying solely on a real-time acoustic monitoring system, which he felt would not provide sufficient warning of potential failure to safely abort the mission and evacuate. After filing the report, he was summoned to a meeting where he was told that the acrylic window on the submersible was only rated for 1,300 meters because OceanGate could not fund the design of a window rated for 4,000 meters. Lockridge reiterated his concerns and stated that he would refuse to allow crude testing without a whole scan. As a result, Lockridge was dismissed from his position. OceanGate even filed a lawsuit against Lockridge, accusing him of improperly sharing proprietary trade secrets 
and fraudulently manufacturing a reason to get rid of him. The suit was settled in November 2018, but the details remain undisclosed. During a human piloted descent on December 10th, 2018, Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate, used the vertical thrusters to overcome unexpected positive buoyancy when descending past 10,000 feet. This caused interference with the communication systems due to the disturbance created by the spinning propellers and the water. They lost contact for one hour. The communications failure would later be a cause for concern and investigation. After these tests were completed in January 2020, the whole of the Titan began showing signs of cyclical fatigue and the craft was derated to 3,000 meters. The hole was repaired and again rated for 4,000 meters of diving depth. But it is unclear who performed the repair and if everything was done properly. It's crucial to note that during an implosion of a vessel, there's probably not a lot. The problem is every craft, every vessel, and every engineering device has an operational lifetime. But what was the operational lifetime of the Titan? Remember, they didn't do NDI or NDT testing to see what was happening to the carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is a mesh weave that is laid in alternating patterns and then glued up. It is incredibly strong and impressive as an engineering material. But it's also not as well studied. We have a hundred years of history and experience with high strength steel, aluminum, and other materials. But this is a new frontier, and that's why it's so important to cover. This vessel just had some sort of crumble or deformation. Something was happening over a couple of cycles. Although they did successfully go down and come back three times, that fourth time, they crumpled. It looks like Stockton Rush was trying to make these tickets affordable. They started at $125,000 and doubled that by the time these guys went on. $250,000 doesn't sound like a ton of money, especially for a trip so risky. The retail price for this probably should have been a million dollars. That allows you to then replace the vessel ever so often, or to do complete disruptive testing to replace parts. There is a whole slew of things that have to happen, but in the interest of trying to be affordable, being on the ship yourself, the prestige of your reputation, trying to build a brand, trying to build a company, they took all kinds of shortcuts and did things they simply did not understand. This is a tragic accident, but it was avoidable. Had OceanGate taken necessary precautions, followed all the procedures, and conducted multiple testing, maybe the five victims would be alive today.